Nowadays, even with how many times he's been adapted to other media, I tend to think of Batman first and foremost as a comic book character, but the first time I ever encountered him, he was on TV. When I was a kid, I watched Super Friends, I watched reruns of The Adam West Show. I knew the Batman comics existed. I saw them on those spinner racks at the bookstore or the magazine shelf at the grocery store. I may have even read one here or there, but I didn't really develop an interest in the Batman comic books, in reading his adventures, in discovering who he was, until the first serious phase of my Batman fandom kicked in after the Batman movie came out in 1989. That summer, to coincide with the release of the movie, DC Comics released a special edition of a miniseries that had originally been published in 1980. This edition included cassettes with audio versions of the story, full vocal cast, music, sound effects. They were like radio plays that you could listen to while you read along with the comics. There was even an original theme song, to which I still remember the lyrics to this day. Please look out. It was corny, it was cheesy as hell, and it made me a fan of Batman comics for life. The title of the miniseries was Untold Legend of the Batman, and while it's not talked about nearly as much as the other landmark Batman comics of the 1980s, Dark Knight Returns, Batman Year One, The Killing Joke, A Death in the Family, etc., it was ahead of its time in some ways, and it served, and still serves, as a good introduction to the comic book version of Batman, his history, his supporting cast, and what makes him special and worth reading about. The story of Untold Legend sees Batman being tormented by an anonymous adversary who seems to know all of his secrets, his true identity, important details about his past, how to get into the Batcave, pretty much all of the stuff he wears a disguise to prevent people from finding out. If you're as big a fan of classic sitcoms and action-adventure TV shows as I am, you may recognize this plot as a standard setup for a clip show. And that's what Untold Legend of the Batman is. A comic book clip show. Sort of. It's not a perfect comparison. If Untold Legend were a clip show in the same sense as an episode of a TV series, it would be made up mostly of reprints of previously published stories, but that's not what Untold Legend is. As Batman works to track down this mysterious new villain, he does flash back to past adventures, but they aren't reprints, they're retellings, with dialogue that is similar and often identical to the original, but all new art. This is why I say this series is somewhat ahead of its time. Some of the most influential and best-remembered comic book stories of the later 1980s and 90s were retellings of classic adventures from a modern perspective. There are many possible examples, but I'm thinking particularly of Kurt Busiek and Alex Ross's Marvel's miniseries, which shows important events in the history of the Marvel Universe as seen from the perspective of a photographer who grows up during the Golden and Silver Ages. Untold Legend of Batman isn't nearly as ambitious or impressive as Marvel's, but it can be viewed as a precursor of sorts. It takes previously published stories, important events in the lives of the characters, and allows us to see them through a more modern lens. In this way, as with Marvel's, Untold Legend operates on two levels. For new readers, like I was in 1989, it provides an entertaining introduction to the characters it depicts and their world. And for readers who know the original versions of these stories, like me today, it shows us what those older stories look like when rendered by artists of a later era. In the case of Untold Legend, we get stories that originally starred the Batman of the 1940s and 50s, told in the style of the Batman of the 70s. That in and of itself is pretty cool, especially when you consider the artists who are doing the retelling. 
The writer of Untold Legend of the Batman is Len Wein, one of the foremost comic writers of the 1970s and 80s. He co-created Swamp Thing and Wolverine, and wrote extensively for Spider-Man, Fantastic Four, and Superman, as well as Batman. Later on, he also wrote episodes for Batman the Animated Series and the X-Men and Spider-Man Animated Series that were also in production at that time. Joining Ween are two of the greatest comic book artists ever. First, penciling the first issue, John Byrne. Do I? In case I do, he's one of the most prolific and influential artists and writers in the history of superhero comics. His run as co-writer and penciler of Uncanny X-Men alongside writer Chris Claremont is legendary. He's also written and or drawn The Avengers, Captain America, The Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, and The Incredible Hulk for Marvel, and Doom Patrol, The Justice League, Wonder Woman, and a whole bunch of Superman and Batman for DC. Aside from his X-Men run with Chris Claremont, Byrne is probably best known for writing and drawing the Man of Steel miniseries that introduced the post-crisis version of Superman in 1986. He will definitely be a subject for my best Superman ever series whenever I get around to starting that, probably sometime in the next few months. Just give me a break, okay? I'm only one person. Jesus. Inking for Byrne on issue one and taking over penciling duties for issues two and three is Jim Aparo. I don't want to say too much about him here because I'll have to repeat myself when I do an entire episode of this series about his work on Batman, but the short version is Aparo was one of the most important artists at DC Comics for over 30 years. His work on Aquaman and Green Arrow was terrific, but he'll always be best remembered for drawing Batman, including by me. When I close my eyes and picture Batman, he looks like Jim Aparo drew him. So, yeah, the creative team on Untold Legend of the Batman is pretty stacked, and the results of all that talent are evident on every page of the series. Issue 1 is centered on Batman's origins, when a Halloween costume once worn by Bruce Wayne's father is stolen from its display case in the Batcave and mailed back in tatters, along with a note taped to the inside of the display case promising his destruction, Batman reflects on some of the important milestones in his life. By now, Batman's origin story has been retold so many times that we all know it by heart and most of us are sick of it, but in the 1980s, the story wasn't quite so worn out. Reading this issue in 1989 and listening to the accompanying cassette was my first exposure to the origin story. And even if it seems like you've seen it a hundred times by now, depending on how old you are or how familiar you are with Batman comics, the version of the origin presented in Untold Legend might hold a few surprises. Remember, this miniseries was first published in 1980, which means this is the origin of the pre-crisis version of Batman. If you're a lot younger than I am, or you only know Batman through the movies or the animated series, you may never have heard this version of the story before. It differs from most of the more recent tellings in a few significant ways. The first thing fans more accustomed to the later versions of the origin might notice about the story as presented in Untold Legend is that it doesn't actually begin with the murder of Thomas and Martha Wayne in Crime Alley. Instead, it begins several years prior to that, with Thomas Wayne wearing that costume at a party. A gang of thugs shows up and snatches Dr. Wayne, bringing him to meet Lou Moxon, their boss, who has recently been wounded during a bank robbery and who wants Dr. Wayne to take out the bullet. Thomas fights his way free and later testifies at Moxon's trial, helping to ensure Moxon is sentenced to a lengthy stretch in prison. Later, when Moxon is released, he hires Joe Chill to murder Thomas and Martha Wayne. In addition to those scenes, we also get to see what happens when Batman finds and confronts Joe Chill, climaxing with Byrne and Aparo's take on this amazing moment when Batman whips off his cowl and declares, I am the son of the people you murdered. I am Bruce Wayne. Good stuff. Though, I have to say, 
a pretty lousy way of protecting your secret identity. No wonder Batman has no idea who stole his father's costume and left him that note if he's just walking into warehouses and shouting his real name at people. Good thing Chill's own gang members kill him seconds later when they find out the existence of Batman is his fault. Otherwise, Joe could have made life pretty difficult for Batman. Well, more difficult, I guess, because the parents killing thing. From there, we're taken through flashbacks of young Bruce going to live with his uncle Philip and meeting Philip's housekeeper, Mrs. Chilton, who is secretly Joe Chill's mother making his vow at the graves of his parents, donning the Robin costume years before Dick Grayson in order to protect his identity while learning how to be a crime fighter from Detective Harvey Harris, discovering in college that his personal sense of justice doesn't always agree with the law, and deciding to become Batman after seeing a bat fly through his window. The issue ends with Batman jumping in the Batmobile and speeding off to continue his investigation. So yeah, there's a lot in this version of the story that has been retconned out since this series was first published. Actually, a lot of it was no longer considered mainstream canon by the time I read the series for the first time in 1989. But it doesn't really matter to me. If you've seen my Star Trek videos, you know what little importance I attach to what is and isn't canon. Broadly speaking, I prefer the more recent versions of Batman's origin. They're simpler, less weighed down by unnecessary detail. I like the killing of Batman's parents to be a random street crime, not part of a conspiracy to get revenge on Thomas. As good as that I am Bruce Wayne panel is, I like the idea that Batman never finds his parents' killer, never even learns the guy's name. And I like knowing as little as possible about what Bruce Wayne does between when his parents are murdered and when he begins operating as Batman, because it doesn't matter to me anyway. Just get him in the damn cape. But all that being said, I still find a great deal of value in the pre-crisis version of the origin we're shown in Untold Legend. For example, Batman tells Alfred that after the death of Lou Moxon, the man who hired Joe Chill to kill his parents, he visited his parents' graves to tell them what had happened, to wish that they could now rest in peace, and to say goodbye. Batman says it was the last time he ever stood by his parents' graves. He tells Alfred that he hasn't gone back to the cemetery since. This is a departure from the more modern versions of Batman, who, it seems, is always hanging around that cemetery. Or, in some versions, there is no cemetery, and Thomas and Martha are actually buried on the grounds of Wayne Manor, so all Batman has to do is walk outside, and he can loom over the graves and gaze forlornly at the headstones whenever he wants. For convenient grieving, entering your loved ones in your backyard cannot be beat. The Batman of this story doesn't seem to have the same morbid preoccupation with the deaths of his parents that many post-crisis versions do. He's still a dark figure. This is the Batman of the 70s, remember, not the smiling, non-threatening, duly deputized agent of the law of the Silver Age, but that darkness isn't centered around constant brooding over what happened to his mother and father. He misses them. Their deaths have had a profound impact on his life, obviously, but by the time of Untold Legend, their murder case has been long closed. He's avenged their deaths, and he's still Batman, because being Batman has meaning to him beyond being a reaction to his own loss and pain. This Batman is driven by more than just his own demons and obsessions. It's also instructive, as a reader and a writer, to be able to read these bits of Batman's origin and consider them in their original context. Like I said, the stories of these flashbacks have all been told before, which makes the untold part of the series title ring a tad hollow, but that's okay. It's a better title than the retold Legend of the Batman. Presenting all these vignettes, Thomas Wayne at the costume party, teenage Bruce dressing up like Robin to get detective lessons, Bruce revealing his identity to Joe Chill, the revelation that Lou Moxon was actually behind the Wayne killings, in a single story, 
gives the impression that someone just sat down and wrote this wacky, convoluted character history for Batman. But, of course, that's not what happened. These stories were the products of multiple artists and writers working independently of one another, originally published years apart, because the creators thought they'd make a good hook for an issue of Batman or Detective Comics. The never-before-seen tale of when Batman was Robin. The incredible story of Bruce Wayne's father, the first Batman. The thrilling adventure where Batman finally confronts the man who murdered his parents. It was all made up by writers, artists, and editors as they went along, with no grand plan and no one getting hung up over things like canon or long-term continuity. One result was, after many decades of this, characters with absurdly complicated histories, sure, but another result, and a much more important one, I would argue, was the creators of these comics having the freedom to imagine what they thought would be a good story and tell it the way they thought it should be told. There was space in the process to be creative, to throw things in, to have fun. The value of works like Untold Legend, then, is as a kind of compendium to pluck this version of the origin from 1939, and this retcon of it from 1948, and this added detail from 1956, and this bit of additional backstory from 1955, and retell it all in one place, as one story, to remind us that, for as messy and meandering as it is, all of it is Batman. Issue 2 of Untold Legend retells the origin of Robin. Since this was first published in 1980, there was still just the one, Dick Grayson. Isn't it amazing how for the first 40 years of Batman's existence, he only had one Robin, and in the 40 years since, he's had like 15? How did Batman writers ever come up with stories when they weren't constantly inventing new Robins? Anyway, we get the story of how Dick Grayson's circus acrobat parents were killed by the mob in order to send a message to the owner of the circus, how Batman took Dick under his wing, became his legal guardian, trained him to be a crime fighter, and gave him his old Robin costume to wear as Batman's sidekick. We also see the origin of Alfred, which again differs from the post-crisis version quite a bit. In the more modern tellings of the story, Alfred was originally the butler of Thomas and Martha Wayne, and after they died, he raised Bruce himself. In the version presented in Untold Legend, young Bruce is raised by his uncle Philip and Mrs. Chilton, and Alfred doesn't come on the scene until much later, after Dick becomes Robin, in fact. Alfred turns up on the doorstep of Wayne Manor to offer his services after the death of his father who had worked for Thomas and Martha many years ago. In this version, Alfred isn't a member of Batman's inner circle from the beginning. He discovers that Bruce and Dick are the dynamic duo one night when they return to the Batcave after Bruce has been injured. Realizing the weight of the secret with which he has now been entrusted, Alfred promises his loyalty and discretion and becomes, as he puts it, both, quote, gentleman's gentleman to wealthy Bruce Wayne, and faithful aide de camp to the Dark Knight detective. Issue 2 also gives us quick flashbacks to the origins of the Joker and Two-Face as Batman, Robin, and Alfred review the major players in the rogues gallery in search of someone who might be Batman's secret tormentor. Then the issue ends with the Batmobile exploding. Hey, come on. Stealing his dad's costume and sending him threatening notes is one thing. Or two things, I guess. But blowing up his car? As that great philosopher Vincent Vega once said, what's more chicken shit than fucking with another man's automobile? The third and final issue of the series has Batman working the streets, digging for a lead, eventually ending up at Commissioner Gordon's office which provides the prompt for a flashback to how Gordon and Batman became allies. When Batman first appears in Gotham, Gordon, being a cop and all, regards him as a criminal and soon becomes obsessed with catching him. Then Batman saves Gordon's life and drops by police headquarters a little later to talk. Gordon pulls his gun and attempts to arrest Batman, but Batman appeals to Gordon's sense of justice. He might work outside the law in order to bring down criminals, Batman says, but he loves the law 
as much as Gordon does, and is ultimately only interested in seeing that justice is done. And that's good enough for Gordon, who lowers his gun and shakes Batman's hand. Gordon's reflections on the start of his friendship with Batman segue into another flashback about how his daughter Barbara became Batgirl, then Robin drops in, and he and Gordon have a little chat about how high-strung Batman's been as a result of this whole someone-knows-all-my-secrets-and-is-using-them-to-destroy-me deal. The next day, after a scene at Wayne Enterprises that includes a brief aside for the origin of top company executive Lucius Fox, which I appreciated reading this at age nine, because Lucius didn't make it out of the comics and into any of the TV or movie adaptations until Batman the Animated Series three years later, Bruce is mulling over recent events, has a shocking epiphany about the identity of his secret adversary, and heads to Wayne Manor, which this being 1980, has been closed up since Dick went off to college and Bruce Wayne and Alfred moved into the city to live in the penthouse atop Wayne Tower. As Batman wanders through the dark, deserted halls of Wayne Manor, he sees ghosts from his past. His father, Alfred, bringing him and Dick their costumes in response to the bat signal. Then he finds himself in the old bat cave when the walls start to close in on him. He sees one final ghost, an apparition of himself as Bruce Wayne, accusing Batman of robbing him of his life, costing him friends and lovers. That's why he, Bruce Wayne, is going to destroy Batman once and for all. I'm reading along, listening to the audio tape of this at age nine, thinking, damn, this shit got deep. Batman is about to lower his arms and allow the narrowing walls to crush him when his father appears, not as a ghost, but in the flesh and wearing that old Halloween costume. He implores Batman not to give up, to jump to safety while he holds back the walls. But Batman refuses to see his father die again and tackles him, pushing them both out to safety just before the walls slam together. They stand up, dust themselves off, and Batman's like, hey, thanks, Robin. So what had happened was, before the start of issue one, Batman was in an explosion, and it turns out the explosion scrambled his marbles a little, resulting in a condition diagnosed by Dick, who was apparently studying clinical psychiatry at that fancy college, as temporary schizophrenia with paranoid delusion. <laughs> The temporary is bearing a lot of weight there, isn't it? Because of this temporary condition, Batman himself has been the secret adversary. Robin put on the old costume and impersonated Thomas Wayne, hoping that the shock would snap Batman out of it, and it worked! Because that's how you cure someone with a mental illness brought on by a serious head injury. You jump out and go boo! Schizophrenia is basically the hiccups for your brain. With everything resolved, Batman thanks Robin, then heads off on his own to think things over. Now, Batman realizes that he's allowed his crime fighting to overwhelm his life, and he needs to find a way to live a little as Bruce Wayne, too. Then, we end the series with this gorgeous one-page panel showing Jim Apero's Batman in all his grimly heroic glory. What makes Untold Legend of the Batman a classic, for me, isn't just the art, which, thanks to Byrne and Apero, is gorgeous, or the script, which establishes Ween as not just an able storyteller, but a nimble curator, reducing decades of comic book history into a fairly tight three-issue series. The really special thing about Untold Legend is how it manages to use all these flashbacks about who Batman is and how he came to be to tell a story that is ultimately about how Batman doesn't really know himself. Post-Crisis, and more specifically post-The Dark Knight Returns interpretations of Batman, have tended to bifurcate the character. Batman is his true self, and Bruce Wayne is the mask he wears to the world, or vice versa. But Untold Legend shows us something different. He's not two people. He's one person. Bruce Wayne isn't a mask, and neither is Batman. They are facets of the same person. A person whose name is Bruce Wayne, and whose name is also Batman. This is a Batman whose life has been irrevocably altered by violence and tragedy, 
but who also refuses to allow himself to be defined by those things. He's not the brutal borderline psychopath of The Dark Knight Returns, or the aloof neurotic of the Tim Burton films, or the self-flagellating obsessive of Christopher Nolan's films. He has shades of all of those, but he's deeper and richer and more complex than any one of them. Of course, by the time of Untold Legend of the Batman's first printing, Batman had been in continuous publication for over 40 years, so what else would you expect? Place him in the hands of dozens of the most brilliant artists and writers their medium has to offer, allow them to tell his stories over the course of multiple decades, then hire one of the best writers and two of the best artists of their generation to distill all of that into a three-issue miniseries, and there's a pretty good chance you'll wind up with the best Batman ever. <laughs>